the formulas and the ADS black holes, which is based on my recent year on my last year paper, and the current work in progress with Professor Kim Young Lee in Chaos. So let me begin by briefly reviewing some basic facts about black holes in the ADS space time. We all know that black holes are thermodynamic objects which follow a certain thermodynamic law. Its simplest form is given as follows without rotation or charges. Here, there is the black hole mass, this is the Hawking temperature, and it determines the Bakkenstein Hawking entropy of the black holes. And the Bakkenstein Hawking entropy takes this following form, where A is the horizon area of the black hole. Well, however, still, the statistical interpretation of the Bakkenstein Hawking entropy is incomplete, which means that we don't know the number of the microstates omega that contributes the black hole entropy as this Boltzmann formula. Since this Bakkenstein Hawking entropy is both quantum and gravitational effect, I think that black hole microstate counting is essential to better understand the quantum gravity. So in order to accomplish this microstate counting, ADS black hole is a kind of a good object to study. If we consider the flat space black hole, we know that it has a negative capacity and therefore they are unstable in the canonical ensemble. However, the ADS spacetime, it has a negative cosmological constant and therefore in ADS spacetime, stable, thermally stable black holes can exist. And furthermore, the ADS spacetime has a, provides a holographic boundary at infinity. And this is the point where we'll use the concept of the ADS safety correspondence. So the most famous example of this ADS safety correspondence is the correspondence between the type 2b string theory in ADS5 times S5 and the 4d n equal 4 UN superman theory. On the bulk ADS5, the Newton constant g is given as follows, which is inversely proportional to the n square of this boundary CFT. So the ADS safety correspondence states that those two theories share the same Hebel space, so it is natural to expect that the black holes in the ADS it's the black hole microstates in the ADS should be visible from the boundary CFT. Also, if we want to study the classical gravity limit in the ADS, we should take the large N and then strongly couple the CFT on the boundary side. And it is usually difficult to find an observable that can be computable in the strongly coupled design. But in the supersymmetric cases, we have a super conformal index, which can be non perturbatively computed in the strongly coupled setting. So the, with the super conformal index, it counts the spectrum of the BPS states on the three sphere times time. And by this ADS safety cor correspondence, we expect that the super conformal index should include the microstates of the BPS black holes in the dual ADS gravity. In 4D and 4 cases, it has five conserved charges. The first one is the two angular momenta J1 and 2 on the three sphere. And the second one is the three R charges, Q1 to 3, which of the SO6 R symmetry. And these R charges are become the electric charges of the dual black hole. And in the BPS sector, the energy is bounded by the, given by the sum of the charges, and the dual black hole is stable and their talking temperature is zero. However, even if the super conformal index can, counts the microstates of the BPS black holes, there is a cancellation between the bosons and the fermions. So there has been a question that whether after the boson phenomenon cancellation, does the index capture the black hole entropy or not? And in the next slide, I will show you a concrete, exact, concrete evidence that the answer is actually yes. So uh, let me talk about how the black hole entropy and the index. Uh, as a simple model, let us consider the 4D n equal 4 U5 superman theory. And the superman index takes the following definition we take a trace of the Hilbert space and with the minus on to the F, and we have a single, we unrefined fugacity with a single fugacity X, which conjugate to these charges. Here J and Q are defined as this. And we consider the fugacity expansion of the index. Then in terms of this fugacity expansion, power of the X becomes the charges of the BPS states and its coefficient omega denotes the number of the microstates after the boson phenomenon cancellation. So by, key, by taking the log of the omega, we obtain the entropy that can be captured from, from the index. So this is the explicit form 
of the free gas expansion. And here I up, uh, write down up to 70 soda, but actually we can go further. So in this plot, I plotted the real part of the entropy as a function of charges. And this red and blue dots are the entropy captured from the, from the Supangmi theory index. And here I overlap the Beckenstein Hawking entropy of the dual ADS5 black hole as an orange line. And surprisingly, the index, can, index entropy is almost the same with the true Beckenstein Hawking entropy of the dual BPS black hole. I have a question. So, yeah. Uh, how many supercharges uh, does it preserve by turning on this Fugasti X? Just, uh, turning on this Fugasti X? Yeah, because in total, 32 yeah. supercharges, right? And the super uh, it, index usually uh, counts it, one one sixteen. Right, right, right. Super think, But if you change some fugacity, I think you you have more enhanced BPS uh, supercharges. Right, right. Do you know? Uh, how? But I, but I'm not sure. Uh, okay. Now they're not sure. Okay. So anyway, I think that this plot is the concrete evidence that the, even after the boson phenomenon cancellation the superconform index captures this black hole entropy. So recently, there has been a substantial development about counting ADS black hole entropy from the dual index. It is first initiated from the magnetic black holes from the topologically twisted index, and it is extended to counting electric black holes from the superconform index. There are several parallel ways for studying this in electric black holes, for example, a generalized Casimir energy or bad transit formalism. But today, I want to focus on the studies based on the cardinal limit asymptotics of this superconformal index. So let me explain the relation between the ADS black holes and the Cardi formulas. Uh, the Cardi formula was originally studied in the 2D CFT, and it, is the, it determines the partition function of the 2D CFT on torus in the Cardi limit. Here, the Cardi limit refers to the large momentum limit on the spatial circle inside this torus. And with this Cardi formula, we, can, we could successfully capture, or successfully compute the D1, D5 black hole entropy from the 2D Cardi formula living on this D1 brains. So we can consider the higher dimensional generalization of this Cardi formula. And in this case, it determines the behavior of the supersymmetric index of d-dimensional SCFT on d minus one manifold times time circle in the Cardi limit. Here, the high dimensional Cardi limit can be straightforwardly generalized, and the high dimensional Cardi limit refers to the large angular momentum limit on this d minus one spatial manifold. Especially when this manifold is a sphere, d minus one sphere, it becomes the superconforming index, and it has been studied in various dimensions. 3D, 4D, or 5D. And for all those cases, the obtained Cardi formula successfully reproduces the entropy of the dual ADS BPS black holes. So, in the same vein, today I want to talk about the 60 Cardi formulas uh, on two different manifolds. The first one is the alpha times T2, and the second one is the S5 times S1. And using the Cardi formula of this S5 times S1, I'm going to show that it precisely reproduces the entropy of the dual ADS7 black holes. So this is the basic introduction. Now I'm going to move on to our main part. So please ask uh, questions. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, so uh, I, I don't know whether this question makes sense, but usually the entropy naively think that it's a degrees of freedom. Right. And, and I think the instead of index, the partial function, partial function means that the index include minus f to the power of f. Right, right. Partial function doesn't. And naively, partial function does com compute the degrees of freedom. And my, if you compute index, some degrees of freedom is canceled. Right. And they, so I'm very cu curious why index instead of partial function correspond to entropy. I think that there's, a, as you said, there's a cancellation between the bosons and the fermions. Yeah, yeah. So this index entropy actually becomes the lower bound of the true entropy. Ah, yeah, that's right. I see, I see. Yeah. I think that's why there's some index is lower than the true entropy, maybe. Ah, I see, I see, I see, I see. Uh, but, but somehow, above, I, I don't know. It. 
um, maybe, or maybe it's not very. Is, is it exactly lower bound, or because there's some smaller charge exceeding and some large charge it's below that? Uh, this, I mean, some exceeding cases. I uh, so even lower charge, like around ten or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think this is just um, just a small quantum fluctuation because we are considering just the finite end cases. Ah, I see. Ah, I see. I see. I see. I see. I see. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, if there's no questions, uh, I'm going to move on to our main uh, our main part. So, uh, in the part one, I'm going to on this talk, I'm going to show the two uh, different approaches to obtain the 60 Cartier formulas. In this first part, I'm going to show how to obtain the 60 Cartier formulas on the alpha times T2 from the elliptic genus of the self gel strings. So let me first begin by briefly introducing some basic facts about the six dimensional superconform field theories. It can have n equal 1,0 supersymmetry for h, h supercharges and 2,0 supersymmetry for 16 supercharges. And also the 60 is the highest dimension that superconformal algebra can exist. And many lower dimensional theories can be obtained by compactifying 60 theories, such as uh, 48 plus R theories. However, it is still an enigmatic quantum field theory. The main reason is that uh, we don't know the Lagrangian description of the 60 theories. However, the existence is predicted by the string theory or M theory construction. For example, uh, we can consider the world volume theory of the N and phi planes, and at the lower energy, it engineers uh, not interacting 60 theories. And the M theory predicts that there should be N cubed degrees of freedom, but the true identity of those degrees of freedom are still mysterious. So let me talk about those n cubed degrees of freedom a little bit more. Uh, I think that the simplest way to understand why n cubed arises in 60 is from the ADSF correspondence. And this version of the ADSF correspondence is the correspondence between the 11 dimensional M theory on the ADS7 times S4 and the 60 Tokomazar SCFT living on this n and phi planes. On, also on the ADS7 side, the bulk Newton constant is given as this formula, which is inversely proportional to the n cube. So if we consider the ADS7 black holes, its back Einstein, its back Einstein okay entropy should be proportional to the inverse of the Newton constant, and it again proportional to the n cube. As again, they, the two theories share the same Hilbert space, it's natural to expect that those n cubed degrees of freedom should exist in the 60 boundary CFT side. However, this n cube factor is larger than the usual n square gauge theory degrees of freedom. And also still the true identity of those degrees of freedom is still mysterious. Well, but there are some partial evidence from the field theory side. For example, those n cubed degrees are, have been studied from the VPS string junctions or boundary states of the five to super mills also, this n cube factor has been found has been observed in the 60 anomaly polynomial or the vacuum Casimir energy. But however, direct n cube counting from the 60 supersymmetric indices without the Casimir factor has been a very challenging problem. And today, I'm going to talk about exactly this factor: direct n cube counting from the 60 supersymmetric index. So I will talk about our setup we will consider the theory of n and phi frames. Or more formally, it is called a 60 to comma zero, a n minus one plus one free tensor as CFT in the AD, AD classification. But it is nothing but a theory, world volume theory of the coincident n and phi frames. It is described by a tensor multiplet, which includes two from tensor field and the five real scholars and their super partners. So the global symmetry, they have a global symmetry. As a for 60 CFT, it has SO6,2 conformal symmetry. And for the 2,0 supersymmetry, it has SO5 R symmetry. And this R symmetry acts, rotates these five real colors. So we can deform this theory at the CFT fixed point by giving a VAV to one of these real colors. For example, we take phi1 to have a VAV v1, v2, dot, 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 vn minus one. 
And the vacuum moduli space parameterized this valve is called the tensor branch. And these valves are called the tensor valves. It's more transparent to, to view the tensor branch in, in the brain setup. In the tensor branch, the coincident and five brains are separated to each other. And its separation distance is proportional to the tensor valve V. Also, M2 brains are suspended between the M5 brains. And the tensor branch physics of the 60 theory can be studied from the M5 M2 brain system. And the separated and the stretched M2 brains becomes the self dual streams in the 60 field theory. So let me explain a bit more about the self dual streams. Uh, the self dual stream is basically an M2 brain ending on M5 brains. And in this case, it's more often called as on just an M strings. In the field theory side, it is a solitonic solution, string like solution, which is charged on the two form tensor field. And it is called the self dual because the field strength of this two form tensor field satisfies a self dual condition inside the 60. Also, the self dual soliton, self dual string soliton, is a tensionful object and its tension is proportional to the tensor of V. So, if, for example, this red self dual string's tension is proportional to the VI. So, I'm going to use the self dual string as a main building block to study the 60 physics. Our main observable is, as I've said, is an alpha times T2 supersymmetric index. It is basically an index of a 60 SCFT compactified on the M theory circle. And after this circle compactification, we obtain the 5D maximally supersymmetric Young Mir theory with colossal Klein instantons, which parameterize the colossal Klein momentum on this M theory circle. So this alpha times T2 index counts the spectrum of the BPS states on the tensor branch. And it can be, uh, it takes the following definition. Then we take a trace over the Hilbert space with the minus one to the F inserted, and we insert various a charge factor. First, we have R4 angular momentum factor J1 and J2, which are conjugate to the chemical potentials epsilon one and epsilon two. And second, we have SO5 R charge factor Q1 and Q2, which are conjugate to the chemical potential epsilon plus plus M and epsilon plus minus M. And here epsilon plus are defined as this. And third, we have a KK momentum vector on the M theory circle, which is P, and it is conjugate to a chemical potential beta. And lastly, on the tensor branch, we insert the chemical potential factor for the self dual strings. Here N, it is the number or the charge of the self dual string, and V is the tensor valve, which is proportional to the tension of the self dual strings. So this alpha times T2 index is our main observable. And one way to compute this alpha times T2 index is to compute the 5D instant partition function of this maximally supersymmetric theories. However, in this talk, I'm going to focus on the different approach, which is based on the elliptic genus expansion of the self-deal strings. The main idea is to view the 6D index as a sum of the 2D indices of the self-deal strings, where the 2D indices is given by the elliptic genus. And more formally, mathematically, it can be written as follows. Here, the 60 index can be written in terms of sum of the string charges with the self dual stream fugacity, and its coefficient is given by the 2D index on the self dual strings. And this, and this coefficient is called the elliptic genus of the self dual strings, which is wrapping on the two torus made of the M theory circle and the time circle. And as overall factor, we have a abelian part which does not couple to the self dual streams. So we're going to use a basic elliptic genesis as a basic, basic building block to study the 60 index. So basically we, we know how to compute the 5D instant partition function and we know how to compute the elliptic genus and we have alpha times t index, we can compute alpha times t to index as far as high order we want. But actually our main goal is to compute the free energy in the Cardi limit for just a 60 Cardi formula. And it turns out that the directly computing the free energy and the Cardi limit turns out to be very difficult. So I will, I will explain what is the Cardi limit on this alpha times T2. It takes the two uh, different, different limit. First, we should take small epsilon one two limit. 
it is the limit, more often called the thermodynamic limit, or just the cyber return prepotential limit. And in the charge sector, it corresponds to the large angular momentum limit, J1 and J2, which are conjugate to this chemical potential. Second, we further take small beta limit, and it corresponds to the limit where the empty recycle decompactifies and the full 60 physics is visible. And in the charge sector, it corresponds to the large P limit, where P is the KK momentum conjugate to beta. So as I've said, the main goal is to compute the free energy, which I refer log Z in the Cardi limit, but it is very non-trivial. I have one main question. Yep. Uh, this may be very stupid, but the index depends on the length of S1 in that case, because of KK momentum. Oh yeah, the length of the S1 is observed in the normalization of these chemical potentials. Oh, I see. So the beta is not the length or one. Yeah, beta one. is uh, actually a complex structure of this torus. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. So it's a complex structure. So it's not the length of circle. Okay. Yeah, that, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So the main difficulty comes from the cardio limit requires, as I've said, beta to zero. The beta to zero limit is the decompactification limit of this M3 circle. And in this limit, Kaluza-Klein instantons are becoming very light, and therefore the instant VST are very close to one. And in this case, the Q series or the instanton series, instanton contributions are not suppressed, and the infinite instanton contributions have to be summed in order to obtain the correct result at the Cardi limit. So we, we circumvent this, this problem by using some non-perturbative properties of the elliptic genus. More precisely, the modular SL2C modular property of the elliptic genus. Uh, specifically, I'm going to use the uh, S duality of the elliptic genus. Uh, so, as we know, elliptic genus is uh, defined on the torus and it enjoys some SL2C modular property. It's more, more precisely, if we are done beta as minus 2 pi i tau, this tau becomes the complex structure of the torus and it becomes the modular parameter. So if we consider the elliptic genus, which depends on the tau and epsilon and m, we take its s duality transformation. Then tau turns into minus one of a tau, and the chemical potentials are divided by tau. And it comes with the additional factor, which depends on the chemical potentials and the string number. And this additional factor is the s to z anomaly of this elliptic genus. And here omega is the SUN cotton matrix. And also, this SL2C anomaly can be completely determined from the 2D chiral anomalies of the 2D theory living on the self dual strings. And this elliptic gen this s duality property plays a critical role when you want, want, want to compute the elliptic genus in the cardio limit. Because uh, in the dual elliptic genus, it depends on minus one of a tau, and therefore dual elliptic genus is at the weak coupling, and at the weak coupling regime, we can simply approximate this dual elliptic genus with the simple perturbative form. Then with this s duality transformation, we finally obtain the elliptic genus in the Cardi limit as the following expression. We can see that the, these two leading terms are order of one over o beta. Therefore, they, are, they give the leading order in the Cardi limit. Also, this formula of the 2D elliptic genus in the Cardi limit is basically a 2D Cardi formula of the 2D CFT living on the self dual string. So I'm going to move on, move back to our 60 theory. As I've said, the 60 index is the sum of the elliptic genus. So basically, if you want to compute the 60 index in the cardio limit, we prepare the elliptic genus in the cardio limit and sum over the all possible string numbers or string charges. And surprisingly, we can see that this summation takes the form of the Gaussian structure with, re with respect to the string number. Here, I will set our chemical potential as epsilon one to be positive, epsilon two to be negative, beta to be positive, and m to be purely imaginary between zero and two pi i. In this chemical potential setting, this quadratic term, the first term is the quadratic with respect to the string number whose coefficient is negative. And therefore, it gives the damping factor of the elliptic genus as I depicted here as a blue dotted line in, the, in this figure. However, in the linear term of the, in the second term, 
it is linear term of the string number, and its co coefficient is positive. So the linear term gives a, a growth factor for the elliptic genus. So the total amplitude of the total amplitude of the elliptic genus takes the form of a Gaussian, which I depicted here as a black black line. And with this Gaussian structure, this discrete summation can be evaluated with the continuum approximation for the string number. Then after the continuum approximation, we can see that this summation can be localized at the non zero value of n, which I denote as n hat, and it is at the peak of, the, of this Gaussian summon. And also we, are, we shall focus on the conformal phase where we will turn off free, so the tension effect, the self the string fugacity effect can be neglected. So after the computation, we can find a peak of the Gaussian n hat, which becomes the setup point of this continuum approximation. And this n hat is given as this following formula. As you can see, this factor is a positive, and therefore we have a positive condensation for the self the string charges. And it has epsilon one and two in the denominator, which is small in the cardi limit. Therefore, n hat is a very large number, much greater than one. Therefore, I want to interpret that this non-zero non -zero expectation value of the string number as a string condensation, more precisely, a condensation of the self dion strings in the tensor branch. So all we need to do is just simple. We insert this, this set point value to this integrand, and then evaluate the 60 free energy in the Cardi limit. But before directly going into the, uh, moving into the answer, I'm going to I'm going to talk about the implication of this of this combinatorial factor k times n minus k. Uh, sorry, may I ask a question, please? Oh, what sure. about the other range of a uh, parameter like epsilon one, epsilon two? Why it has to be restricted to this uh, this uh, range? Plus and minus. Yeah. What about uh, the other? And uh, also the. Set, yeah. I think if we both epsilon to be set positive, definitely the summation is not convergent. And in this case, I think the elliptic uh, the string number expansion becomes some asymptotic expansion of some more divergent series. But physically, case, what uh, is it that corresponds to? I mean, physically, why this range is preferred than the other? Well, this is just really practically selected to ensure the convergence of the series. Mm -hmm. Uh, another question is, uh, is it obvious that uh, the 6D uh, uh, index is the, um, the sum of the um, elliptic, elliptic genus? Is it, this is an assumption or oh, um, me, not a, an obvious? Uh, it has been tested in various, various ways. Mm -hmm. For example, by comparing the 5D instant partition functions and they all coincide. Okay, in the full, in the full, uh, without any restriction or only in some limit or? Uh, as far as now, I know, without any restriction. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So uh, I'm gonna uh, show some implication of this combinatorial factor K times N minus K. I think it is quite related to the n cube counting from the, in the 60 theories. Uh, okay, as I've said, the string condensation value N hat is proportional to the k times m minus k. And I think it is related to the W boson and the instantum bound state in the 5D superhuman theory, which was, which was observed around 10 years ago. So as I've said, a self your string is an M2 brain suspended between the M5 brains. So let us consider this just a simple toy model with brain system with n equals six M5 brains. So here I draw the six M5 brains as a horizontal black lines. And I drew uh, multiple M2 brains as a vertical orange line. So this M2 brains becomes the W boson in the 5D superhermias. And if M2 brains are crossing on M5 brains, there can be a non-zero color supply momentum, which becomes the instantons in this 5D superhermia theory. And it was found that the W bosons and the instantons can form a non-trivial bound state. And I think this, this factor can be naturally expect, explained with this bound state of the W boson and the instantons. 
For example, in the first sector, we have a five different degrees of freedom, which can be divided into one times five. And in the second factor, we have a eight degrees of freedom, which can be divided into two times four. And by summing over all those degrees of freedom, we obtained n cubed minus n over six, which is proportional to the n cubed in the larger limit. Well, this is an interesting computation, but I uh, but I still think we still need a more further study on this micros microscopic degrees of freedom. So let me get back. Excuse me, I'm sorry, question. I, I couldn't hear when you see the instant unbound state in terms of M2s. I, I, I misheard. Uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was first observed in the different paper. No, I mean in your drawing, in your, the, the, uh, what did the blue dots mean? I assume that after, uh, every time when the M2 brains are crossing the M5 brains. Ah, okay, crossing, yeah. okay. Yeah, there's a KK momentum bounded, yeah. I have a question, um, yep. namely the case, the different case corresponds to different saddle points or what, what is this? A different K? Yeah. Oh, well, there are multiple number of the, multiple number of the strings. Yeah. And this K equal one corresponds to the strings between the first M5 brain and the second M5 brain. No, but in the, in your previous formula, yeah. when you were doing this, um, yeah, saddle point approximation. Okay. If you go back to the previous slide. So you have this, uh, you basically this, this turns into a path integral or an integral, the sum, okay, in this right. limit. Right. And then you do some saddle point approximation and then uh, get this, um, yeah, uh, if you want this uh, n hats, right? Right. And uh, so the K is running basically, is, is basically corresponding to the index I in that sense, or? Right, right, right. Same as I. Okay, yeah. so then the other thing is, because usually if you talk about index, so this, this Z which you're computing is, the, which, which is what I would call the partition function, right? Because it's on T2 times R4. Right, the right. index is usually would be S1 times S5, right? Uh, if you call the super conform index, it is, yeah. But in this case, um, you you just want to talk about the T two times R four. Right, right. That is, uh, I see. Mm -hmm. Because um, yeah, but but um, you want to make you want to relate it to um, entropy at the end of the day. Yeah, at the end of the day, I'm going to talk about the S five times S one also, and the entropy of I the black holes. Okay. 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 Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Uh, okay. Sorry for the confusion. Okay. So we're gonna go back and we will insert this set point value to this integrand to obtain the free energy of this alpha times T2 index Z. So this is our final result. After inserting the set point value, the log of the Z, which I call the free energy, is given as minus n cube over 24 m squared to pi i minus m squared over epsilon 1, epsilon 2, beta. First of all, in our chemical potential setting, epsilon 1, epsilon 2, beta is a negative, and therefore the total free energy is positive, which means there are a large, um, large number of the degrees of freedom. And also, as we observed, the non-zero string condensation is critical for the NQ factor of the free energy. And I think the direct evidence of the NQ degrees of freedom from the field theory side. And this elliptic genus approach can be, uh, this approach based on the elliptic genus sum can be applied for various other theories. For example, we can apply to less, less supersymmetric 1,0 theories, such as a rank N A string theory. Even in elliptic genus, you have minus one to the F, right? Right, right. Uh, so how do you explain, is there no cancellation or how do you explain uh, this no, NQ behavior? Uh, or we, you take no, a good limit? No, if we take M to be just uh, zero, okay. the free energy is zero, I think it is the cancellation between the bosons and fermions. But if we tune M to be pi i, uh -huh. the free energy is maximized. Oh, I see. And I think is, this is the point where the cancellation is maximally obstructed. I see, I see. Okay, thanks. Yep. Uh, let me move on to our second part. In this part, I'm going to 
Uh, can I ask a question? You obtain sure. this uh, n cube by the Cardi limit. And I right. think when you explain Cardi limit, uh, originally it was a strongly coupled limit, or, but after f duality it becomes weak or something. And then so it means that only perturbative part was necessary to reproduce n cube or something. Maybe I misunderstood something, but oh, sorry, when but you yeah. uh, when you explain s to a uh, Cardi limit, originally it was difficult, but after s duality it becomes easy. Uh, yeah, and yeah, right, right. In that explanation, I think, is it weak coupling limit or something? Or, uh, no, no, it's a, the elliptic transform is a strong coupling limit. Is that better to be zero? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Talking about this as the LDT. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's what I was uh, having in mind. It, tau, so after this S duality becomes easy, that's what you said, I think. Right, right. And is it? Originally, you said that the instanton, uh, instanton is light, like instanton factor becomes. Yeah, it is not suppressed. Yeah. Instanton yeah, yeah. Uh, so, sorry, not instanton, KK instanton. Okay. KK, uh, but okay, KK instantons are light, but the, the dual means KK instanton is heavy, is it? All right, dual instantons are very heavy. So, so it means that only zero mode is enough? Or well, only perturbative mode is enough. Uh, yes. Perturbative part is enough. Okay, okay. Yeah. So you said that the only perturbative part is enough to reproduce n cube. Oh, with the S duality, yeah. Oh, with the S duality. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah. That's amazing. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'll move on to our uh, last part of my talk, which is based on the Cardi formulas from the anomalies. And in this part, I'm going to show how to obtain the 60 Cardi formulas on the S5 times S1 from the Tift anomalies of 60. So in this case, our main observable is the superconform index, which counts the spectrum of the BPS states in the S5 times time. So there are various global symmetry charges. First one comes from the SO6,2 conformal algebra, whose cut-down charges are given by energy and the three angular momentum. And there's a SO5R symmetry for 2,0 theory, and its cut-down charges are given by Q1 and 2. And for the BPS sector, the energy is bounded by the sum of the charges as follows. So we're going to define the superconforming index in a little bit of modified basis, which I'm going to explain now. First, we take a trace over Hilbert space with the chemical potential insertion. We first insert S5 angular momentum factor, J1, J2, J3, which are conjugate to the chemical potentials omega 1, omega 2, and omega 3. And then we insert the R charge factor, Q1 and Q2, which are conjugate to the delta one and delta two. In order to preserve the supersymmetries, this chemical potential should be able, should satisfy this linear relation. Sum of delta minus sum of omega is two pi i. And this two pi i plays a critical role for preserving the supersymmetry because this two pi i can be observed into one of this omega. And then it generates the additional factor e to the two pi i j i. And this J is a integer for bosons and a half integer for fermions. And therefore it's equivalent to the minus hundred F factor, which is omitted in this trace definition. So we're basically defining the superconforming index in the modified basis so that the two pi a shift of the chemical potential relation plays the role of the boson fermion cancellation. So it turns out to be very uh, somehow related with a better basis for studying the black entropy. And in this basis, the Cardi limit is defined in the limit where the three omegas are very small to one, small del smaller than one. And in the charge sector, it corresponds to the limit where the all three angular momenta are very large. So one can basically compute this, five, this 60 superconform index by a localization of the 5D superconform theory on the S5. However, the localization formulation is incomplete if the full chem if the old chemical potentials are fully refined. So today I'm going to introduce a different approach, a more kind of intrinsic approach based on the chiral anomalies. So I'm gonna I'm gonna call this approach as a background field analysis. And the basic idea is to view the index as a thermal partition function with supersymmetric boundary condition imposed on this tempor temporal circle. In this case, the chemical potentials are viewed the chemical potentials of the global symmetries are viewed as a background fields of global symmetries. 
And in this case, we have a, as a background field, we have a metric tensor G mu nu and the asymmetric gauge field A. They are all the known dynamical fields. And they, depends on, and they depend on the chemical potentials as follows. The 60 metric G mu nu takes the following depend, de definition, where it depends on the angular momentum chemical potentials omega. And the asymmetric gauge field A depends on the asymmetric, it's a purely temporal holonomy, and it depends on the asymmetric chemical potential delta. And those are 60 field. And if we consider the compactification on this temporal circle, this 60 metric is decomposed into the Dillard tone and this gravity photon and the five metric. And also this 60 gauge field are decomposed into the scalar gravity photon and the five gauge field. So with this basic, with this background fields, I'm gonna construct the 5D effective action on the phi sphere. First of all, this circle reduction can be, val uh, can be validified in the Cardi limit because the, the circle radius this S1 circle radius is proportional to the R5 times omega, where R5 is the radius of the S5. So if we consider the cardiac limit where omega is much smaller than one, this S1 becomes much smaller than the S5, and we can integrate out all the dynamical color supply modes on the S5. And after formally integrating out all of them, we obtain the 5D effective action of the background fields. So with the 5D effective action, the superconform index C can be written as exponential of the minus 5D effective action and plus some possible zero model contributions, uh, which comes from the dynamical fields, which remain massless, which remain massless after the circle reduction. But I'm gonna focus on this effective action on the 5D. Formally, we cannot compute this 5D effective action without honestly performing the path integral. But actually, the certain terms in this 5D effective action can be successfully, can be completely constrained from the tuft anomalies. So I'm gonna explain some fact about the tuft anomalies. Tuft anomaly is an anomaly under the background global symmetric transformation. So if you consider the background transformation of this effective action, with the presence of the tuft anomaly, this non-zero, and it is parameterized by a sixth form integral of the six manifold. And this sixth form, I6, is determined from the descent mechanism. I6 is determined from the I7. The I7 is determined from the I8. And this eight form I8 is called the anomaly polynomial. And this anomaly polynomial completely determines the 5D transcyme terms. Because the, as I've said, the 5D effective action have infinitely many terms which can be arranged in the derivative expansion. And among these infinitely many terms, the 5D chun Simons terms can be determined from the anomalies because the 5D chun Simons terms are directly related to this non invariance of this effective action. For example, if the anomaly 8 form is, is given by just a gauge anomaly, pure gauge anomaly, the 5D effective action can be written in terms of the mixed chun Simons terms with the gravity photon and the 5D asymmetric gauge field in the following form. And also, this 5D chun Simons terms usually have a lowest number of the derivatives and other non trans simons terms and the zero model contributions, and they are shown to be some leading in the Cardi limit. So the, with the anomaly polynomial, we can determine the five to trans simons terms. And by integrating them, integrating them, we can obtain the effective action, which gives a leading contribution at the Cardi limit. So I'm gonna show a concrete example. Uh, first, let us consider 60, uh, 2 comma zero Cardi formulas. Uh, 62 comma zero SCFTs have AD type classification, and the global symmetries are given by SO5 R symmetries and the SO6 isometry on the phi sphere. And the anomaly polynomial is given as follows. Here H is the dual Coxart number, D is the dimension, and R is the rank of this AD type B algebra. And here P1 and P2, they are the Pontryagin classes, first Pontryagin class and second Pontryagin classes. So with this anomaly polynomial, we construct the 5D transcyme terms as follows. The result are a bit complicated, but this is the full result. So for example, this term is the pure asymmetric gauge transcyme terms. And for example, this term, uh, for example, this term is a pure 
gravitational transient terms from the gravitational anomaly. And there can be also uh, mixed transient terms between the gravity and the gauge field. But the form is complicated, but it is straightforward to integrate them over the five sphere to obtain the transient action. So after integrating them, you obtain the following Cardiff free energy, log z. Yeah, it takes a complete, complicated form. But as you can, what we can see is that the first line is the leading term in the Cardi limit because it depends on the one over omega cube. And the second term is the sum leading corrections in the Cardi limit, which depends on the one over omega, which scales as one over omega. Therefore, this Cardi free energy takes the form of the Cardi series in the sense that the sum leading corrections can be also determined from anomalies. And I could also check that it is in complete agreement with the result in part one, if we take the background geometry, background manifold as R4 times T2. So with this Cardi formula, what I want to study is the large end limit and its correspondence with the black hole entropy. So as the simplest cases, we consider the large end free energy of the AN SCFT. In this case, among these many terms, the large end contribution comes from this first term. And for the AN Lie algebra, uh, sorry, there's type of A n minus one, it should be A n minus one. For A n minus one Lie algebra, this coefficient precisely becomes the n cube. So the log z in the large n becomes, can be written as minus n cube over 24, delta one square, delta two square divided by omega one to three. And it, I will show that it exactly reproduces the black hole entropy of the dual 87 BPS black holes. So let us move on to the BPS black holes in the ADS7. First, we can compute the entropy from the Cardi formula as follows. Uh, as we all know from the statistical, classical statistical mechanics, the entropy is given by the Legendre transformation of the free energy. So we have a large and free energy obtained from the Cardi formula, and we add them the corresponding conjugate charges. And then we extremize this expression with respect to the chemical potential, and then we obtain the entropy S, which is a function of the charges. This expression is very complicated, but actually this entropy can be computed, and it can be compared with the entropy of the dual ADS7 black holes. It can be obtained by the uh, 11 supergravity on ADS7 times S4, with the consistent rotation on S4, and there's a known solution with the electric rotating black holes in the ADS7, whose three angular momentum are said to be the same. In this case, it's BPS entropy is given as follows, which depends on Q1 and Q2 and angular momentum J. And here, N cube can be translated to the Newton constant in ADS7 with this formula. And we could check that the entropy computed from the Cardi formula is exactly the same with this entropy formula, which is computed from the horizon area of the black hole. So as in the 2D cases, we confirm that the 60 Cardi formulas reproduces the black hole entropy if we take the, it's the larger limit of the Cardi formula. So this is our main result for the 60 Cardi formulas in the ADS black holes. Now I'll move on to our last part. Uh, since the anomaly-based approach is quite general, we can apply to more, uh, less supersymmetric cases with 1,0 supersymmetry. In this case, the most general, uh, in this case, it has global symmetry of SU2R symmetry and the SO6 symmetry. And with those two global symmetry, we can construct the most general anomaly polynomial as follows. Here, C2 is the second chunk class, and the A, B, C and B, they are the coefficient which parameterize the anomaly. So the first term is the pure R symmetry anomaly, and the second term is the mixed anomaly between the R symmetry and the gauge uh, gravitation. And the second and the third term is the pure gravitational anomaly. So with this, card, with this anomaly polynomial, we can construct a five defective action, and by integrating them out, we obtain the Cardiff free energy given as follows. It again parameterized by three, four anomaly polynomial, coefficient A, B, C, and D. So with this Cardi formula, you obtain, without taking the larger limit, you just compute the asymptotic entropy in the Cardi limit. 
by taking the Legendre transformation of this free energy. For simplicity, we take all omega i's to be the same. And in this setting, the real part of the asymptotic entropy is given as follows. It comes with uh, some factor which is proportional to the a minus 4b plus 16c times some positive number. And the cardio limit is a kind of very large charge limit in the BPS sector. And in the large charge limit, we expect there are large number of degrees of freedom, which means that the real part of the entropy should be non-negative. So this asymptotic entropy in the cardio limit uh, imposes uh, some entropic bound on the animal coefficient, which means that A minus 4B plus 16C should be non-negative. And I checked that this coefficient at uh, this condition is satisfied for all, uh, for various 60 SCFTs. And I think that this condition is universally imposes some consistency condition for 60 SCFTs. So let me conclude my talks with some remarks. Now in the first part, I talk about the 60 cardiformers from the self field strings. And I studied the 60 SCFTs on the alpha times T2, which is in the tensor branch, and that can be studied from the electric genus of the self field strings. You observe that the number of the self field strings are condensated to the non-zero value, and it corresponds to the n cube free energy for 60 SCFTs on n and phi planes. And in the second part, we consider the 60 Cauchy formulas from the anomalies. Um, we introduce the concept of the background fit anal analysis, which can, which can be applied for general 60 SCFTs. And for the superconformal index, its free energy accounts for the entropy of the VPS black holes in the dual ADS7. And for the 1,0 theories, we found a non-trivial bound on the anomaly coefficient in 60. So I think there are some future directions that can that is worth pursuing. The first one is I think it is quite interesting if we can study the 5D Cauchy formula on the alpha times S1. For the 5D SCFT, we expect there are n to the five to half degrees of freedom, and I'm I'm not sure whether such degrees has been found, and such degrees has not been found in the Coulomb branch. I think the 5D Cauchy formula on the alpha times S1 could reveal this large number of degrees of freedom in the Coulomb branch. And it might be interesting if we can also find some non-trivial deconfining mechanism, such as a stream condensation in the 5D Coulomb branch. And also, uh, I basically used an elliptic genus approach. Continuum summation of the elliptic genus can be applied to the little string theory. And since little string theory is a non-local field theory, uh, I think by applying our technique to the little string theory is also kind of interesting future directions. So um, this is it, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Let's thank the speaker by whatever method. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? I'm sorry, I'm still confused with a similar point that okay. yeah. because a card, it seems a cardio limit seems to be throw away culture claim mode. Is it true? Sorry? Cardi, uh, cardi limit means to throw away all culture claim mode. It includes all culture claim modes. Include? Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, oh, really? Uh, because you start, uh, uh, originally you said that the, before S dual it's a light, so after S dual it becomes heavy, right? Right, right. So but, but in still the, include? Still, we are considering the original Cardi setting. It, it includes every class of play modes. Uh, uh, what happens after S-duality? Well, that's S-duality is just a technical part. And after taking the S-duality, uh, I mean, this right-hand side. Yes. Uh, we're, in this case, the class of play modes can be thrown away. Oh, OK, OK. But yeah, the original setting, the effect of the class of play towers are included in this S-duality formula. Ah, I see. That, that's why this part is very important. Okay, I understand the point. Okay. Ah, and is this SL2Z anomaly part is related to the anomaly polynomial discussion which you did, or it's not? It's like related to the 2D chiral anomaly. Ah, so it's something else. Uh, it's something else, yeah. Okay. Not 60 anomaly, 2D anomaly, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, thank you. Yep, thank you. Yeah.
Any other questions? Uh, may I ask something? Oh, sure. sure. Uh, can you go to page 27 in your presentation? Okay. Uh, 27, 27. Uh, 27, okay. Uh, yeah, the, there, there you have in, on the bottom uh, these coefficients A, B, and C, calligraphic, yeah. Okay. Uh, can, can you tell a bit more about them? So they, they are coefficients that come from the anomaly polynomial that I understood. Right. And right. the question is, can you hook up a, a theory where this condition will not be satisfied, the A minus 4B plus 16C will be smaller than zero or equal to zero? Uh, I haven't found any such example which this condition is violated. Mm, yeah. Okay. I couldn't look up any examples here. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, in the beginning of the talk, yep. uh, in, uh, so when, when you were computing on, on R4 times T2, you yes. said, and this I think is a bit the same question that Nopadol was asking, that you are going to choose epsilon one bigger than zero, epsilon two smaller than zero. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, and then right. a continuous approximation. So uh, no, I think Nopadol asked, uh, why do you choose this? And you said it's by convenience to make the, the sum convergent. And he asked okay, if yeah. you could the other way. So epsilon one smaller, epsilon two bigger. And you said yes. Yeah. Oh, so, uh, sorry. So, so is it possible to choose epsilon one smaller than zero, epsilon two bigger than zero? It will okay. still make the sum convergent. Sure, sure. Yeah. Good, good. And this restriction, what's what's the physics in it? I mean, I understand you want this sum to be convergent. Okay, yeah. But what what are you doing when you are doing this? What what are you imposing on the system when doing this? I mean, the physical meaning of this. Uh, uh, some kind of weird choices. I, I, up to now, I, I don't have any concrete answer for why should, why should this choice is, is, is imp should be imposed. Mm. I think I should be, I should think about it more, yeah. Okay, and uh, let me ask you one more, a bit related to this. This is okay. more a, just to try to get the, the physical picture here. Why is it the case that the dynamics of the 6D theory is captured by this 2D theory? This obviously is maybe a question that should be asked in, in those papers uh, by Bafa, Aguijat, uh, Lockhart, etc., that you cited. Uh, but why, why is it that the 2D theory is capturing the dynamics of the 6D theory, at least for this observable? I mean, so here, here you're studying the, the M strings, right? Right. Right. right? And these are 2D dynamics. These are 0, 4, 2D theories. Right, but you're right. learning things about the 6D theory. Oh, right, right. Uh, actually, I think that uh, it's alpha times T2. And yeah. the elliptic genus and self data string is just wrapping on this T2. Correct. But on the alpha, we are turning on the, some omega backgrounds. So uh -huh. every path integral is localized at the origin of alpha. I see. So I think that's the reason why we can study 60 from this just 2D physics. I see. I see. Do, do you expect this to be a coincidence for this observable, or do you think many other observables will have the same? I think many other observables will be the same. Okay. All right. Thanks very much. Eh? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Any other question? Maybe Yan Zhu Hao? Yeah, um, I actually have a question uh, about the details. <clears throat> so for the formula uh, you showed for two common zero and one zero. Right, right. It looks like one zero is shorter than the two zero. That's, uh, that's not a very reasonable thing. It's shorter than two zero? Yeah, yeah because two ah, zero is think, more simple. I think that's right. You are yeah. supposed to have more longer formula. Right, but the reason is that and for one zero CFT, I only turn the SU2 R symmetry. That's and in true, principle, yeah. there can be other flavor symmetries for E8 symmetry kind of thing, but I all turn them off. I only consider SU2 R symmetry. 
but on the two zero side, I turn the on SO5 asymmetry. And yeah, can you explain a little bit more about these two formulas? Say for the two zero, you have three terms, like right, the right, three right. terms. Log Z, there are three terms. So why there are no analog in the one zero? But no you didn't write yeah. subleading, did you? Oh yeah, you did. Sorry. Well, if we set delta one and delta two to be the same, yes, it's the same setting where this only single figure has triple asymmetry. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, and then we it two zero formula reduces to one zero formula. Are you? Oh, that's consistent. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think if you have further question, maybe you can ask him uh, in informal discussion after switching off the recording. So for at this moment, let's thank the uh, speaker for wonderful talks. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and if you have. Yeah, some, if, if you have some informal discussion uh, or informal question, just ask me.